Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back, and hope you've enjoyed your lunch. So we begin this afternoon uh, with session five. The topic for this session is genomics for clinical research. This session will be chaired by Professor Sanjeev Galande. Professor Galande uh, obtained his master's degree from University of Pune in biotechnology, and then he completed his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from IISC Bangalore. Professor Galande is a renowned cell biologist and an epigeneticist. He earlier served the Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research, Pune, as professor of biology and dean of research and development. Professor Galande is the recipient of International Senior Research Fellowship Welcome Trust, UK. He's also received the DBT National Bioscience Award, the prestigious Swarnajanti Fellowship, and the coveted CSR's Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize. He is currently the Dean of School of Natural Sciences, Shiv Nadar University. Professor Galande, I welcome you to the stage here. And let's begin the session. I request you to introduce the speakers. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, welcome back to the afternoon session. I hope everybody's settled and people still coming in. So uh, I was told that in this session, uh, we'll have uh, only three talks. Uh, one of the speakers is not here. Uh, so everybody will get 20 minutes for the presentation, followed by five minutes for Q&A. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, first speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Rob Freistadt. Uh, uh, Rob received his uh, degree, uh, medical degree in epidemiology and biostats at the George Washington University School of Public Health and Health Services in Washington, D.C. in 2003. Uh, his research has been continuously funded uh, by NIH, since then, 2003 onwards, he is the principal investigator for international collaborative initiatives studying injury and repair to the lung and systems biology investigations in obesity. In addition, he was recipient of the 2011 International Klosterfrau Award for research of airway diseases in childhood. Uh, Dr. Freistadt is past president of the American Federation for Medical Research and is an active member of the American Thoracic Society and Society for Pediatric Research. Thank you, Sanjeev. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be able to do this as my last act here on this trip to India before I fly back home. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about obesity. And I don't know why they schedule my obesity talks right around lunch, but that's the way it always happens. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. So. We're going to spend, how do I make this go forward? Oh, there we go. So just a couple of conflicts. In addition to being um, a scientist, I actually founded and run two companies, Uncommon Cures and Adipomics, um, which hopefully we'll be doing additional work with, uh, with Genotypic going forward. Um, so let's talk about obesity and how the nomenclature causes problems in terms of uh, understanding obesity-related disease. So for those who don't know, um, obesity is defined by BMI, body mass index. And that's a calculation based on height and weight. And it's a worldwide health problem, as you can see on the graph to the right. Um, it's been getting worse and worse over the course of the past 30, 40 years. Um, but obesity is classified into several categories. Um, you have your overweight and then class 1, 2, and 3 obesity as, as the BMI gets higher. The problem is BMI doesn't really explain uh, the association between obesity and comorbid disease. Um, there's this concept called the obesity paradox, which is really a BMI paradox. So when you look here at this study from 2019, looking within a bunch of groups, all participants here, the association between BMI along the x-axis and all-cause uh, mortality along the y-axis, what you see is at these normal range, this is the normal range of BMI here. And while obesity increases the risk of all-cause mortality, so does being too lean. Um, and, and so th that's been a, a described phenomenon for, for many years. And, and so what people are beginning to realize is that obesity as a, just a function of BMI um, really doesn't explain the association with metabolic health or unhealth in this case. And this is uh, from last year in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition where they 
have this new model, this BMI along the x-axis and risk of disease along the y-axis, and patients typically fall into one of these four groups. So here's your metabolically healthy non-obese, and then your metabolically healthy obese, which is a real thing. Um, and then you're, this is the group where things really get ugly, and that's in the metabolically unhealthy obese. Um, and so these patients have increased adiposity, and they have um, decreased tissue function and, and dyslipidemias, et cetera, um, whereas your metabolically healthy obese do not, aside from the increased adiposity. They don't have the other metabolic components. So BMI is really not explaining everything that we need to understand. And so this study that came out a couple years ago is really the largest that illustrates this. So this is from the Nurses' Health Study uh, in the UK. And um, these women were followed for 30 years for incident cardiovascular disease and cross-classified by this new categorization of BMI categories so and metabolic health defined by, not ideally, the absence of, of other diseases like diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. What you can see is that in the normal weight and obese, metabolically healthy individuals, obesity by itself, so this BMI designated um, definition, uh, increases the risk of cardiovascular disease by a decent amount, so going from 1 to 1.47 in the hazard ratio, age-adjusted. But let's look at these metabolically unhealthy individuals. So normal weight, metabolically unhealthy, the hazard ratio is already two, over 2. And the more weight you add, the higher it gets. So there's really a difference between this obesity definition by BMI and the contribution to disease provided by metabolic unhealth. So what are we missing? So this is the classic image, and I love this. Um, you know, this is what we think about. We had too much lunch up here, and then that's our positive energy balance, and the body's running out of place to put the, uh, the lipids, and so it starts to stick it in after the adipose tissue is expanded, starts to put adipose tissue in other places. That leads to insulin resistance, increased cardiometabolic risk, and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And the connection here is one that, that I, I'm working on, I'm going to show you some data about, is this idea of adiposopathy, which is sick fat. So how does fat get sick and make us sick? So first of all, how does fat that's here make the rest of the body sick? So how does it communicate? Well, it uses all four methods of, of intracellular communication, gap junctions. Uh, let's see, is it going? There we go. Uh, endocrine release of things like uh, leptins, cytokines, and then the other thing that, that we discovered a few years back is that they, adipose tissue releases exosomes, these, these little vesicles, and they contain microRNAs, and they have very potent effects on uh, target cells elsewhere in the body. And so our first paper on this was published back in 2015, where we looked at a small group of adolescents who had had bariatric surgery. Here you can see these BMIs ranging from low 30s to 50. Um, and then some lean subjects that all had uh, appendicitis and had appendixes removed. And um, here, oops, go back. Here's the, um, the procedure. It's a gastric sleeve. Um, so they get some resected stomach. We took out fat, uh, isolated the in culture, and isolated the exosomes from that. And what we found um, is that there were 55 microRNAs contained within the exosomes that were differentially expressed between our obese uh, bariatric surgery patients and our uh, lean patients. And those 55 microRNAs, because microRNAs are so, oops, they're such signal amplifiers, they targeted almost uh, 8,000 mRNAs, and primarily ones in the Wnt beta catenin pathway, TGF beta, et cetera. You can see, oops, I keep doing that. You can see the, uh, one of the pathways here, the type 2 diabetes signaling, green being down, red being up and how those obese exosomes were suppressing TGF-beta and Wnt components. Um, on the right side there, you can see how uh, they appear when we, when we uh, fluorescently labeled them and put them into cells. Um, you can see how these, after just a few hours, the cell cytoplasm lights up with these membranes and the contents are being delivered. So additionally, we wanted to see what happens with extreme weight loss. And so we looked at six adult patients who underwent bariatric surgery and then had uh, visceral fat uh, biopsies uh, 12 months later. You can, I keep doing that. 
You can see the, the dramatic weight loss that happens after bariatric surgery. This was a RU&Y procedure and improvement in HOMA IR, so insulin resistance. Um, what we found was that there were 292 mature microRNAs that uh, changed expression pre versus post. Uh, 168 of those mapped that corresponded to 7,000 mRNAs. And here are just a, a sampling of the pathways that uh, were predicted to be affected uh, and responsive to surgery. So things like IGF-1 and insulin receptor signaling were greatly improved and, and correlated to, to HOMA. And here you can see an example of the upregulation in the insulin receptor and several key mediators within that pathway. So since the time we published, there's been a lot of work and interest in this area, and this paper came out just last year, um, describing how adipocyte-derived exosomes can be responsible for multiple uh, distant organ function, liver, muscle, lung, et cetera. So we just published this paper, it came out in December. Um, we were very interested not just in how fat talks to uh, other organs in the body, but what happens if there's another person there? So what happens when a woman is, is obese, has a adiposopathy, and is pregnant? Um, do those exosomes cross the placenta? We know they do. And can they affect fetal development? And as a pediatrician, of course, that's something that's particularly of interest to me. So, here you can see a, a picture that we put together of the changes that happen during pregnancy in a, in a lean individual. There's this anabolic and catabolic phase, and, and there's significant energy effects on the fetus. However, in obesity, they don't have those two phases. They just have worsening inflammation and insulin resistance and altered placentation and, and certainly increased risks of fetal malformations, congenital heart disease being a, a prime one. All right, so, so we looked in a, in a cohort of infants and, and moms um, where we had samples. This was actually in Pune where we had samples from the third trimester and looked at uh, adipocyte-derived exosomes in the moms as well as in the cord blood and found a bunch of things that were associated with the uh, adiposity of the infant and influenced by maternal uh, adiposity as well. And here you can see some of the pathways involved um, are the key things like insulin signaling, TGF beta signaling, the same things that we've been seeing in, those, in our adolescents um, we see in these uh, third trimester uh, infants and their moms. Um, so we wanted to look even earlier because we think the effects during pregnancy are, are certainly driven earlier in the process. So here's some first trimester data from mom. And it's, it's really striking how clean the first trimester data is when the the fetus isn't, or the infant isn't big enough to, to really contribute to the overall adipocyte exosomal load. And we see a much clearer picture of insulin receptor signaling and STAT3 signaling, important adipogenesis pathways, and, and two microRNAs in particular that are known to be associated with uh, fetal malformations and insulin uh, resistance, 92 sorry, keep doing that, 92A3P, uh, 584-5P. These are really important uh, signaling modulators in those diseases. So then we wanted to say, really we were interested in what's happening before the first trimester. So during that pre-implant or post-implantation period where we have no placental filter. And so obviously we can't do that in humans, but we, so we created this model uh, where we, we basically used human adipocyte-derived exosomes. Let me see if I can get this to advance. There we go. Human adipocyte-derived exosomes with a mouse embryo at E8.5. And so you can see what that typically looks like here. Here's one of our embryos in a, in a roller bottle. It goes into this culture, and we can culture it for 24, 48 hours. In this case, we did it for 24 and exposed either to no adipocyte-derived exosomes or adipocyte-derived exosomes from metabolically unhealthy but not frank diabetes patients versus those with frank diabetes. And importantly, you can see the yolk sac that we dissect here as well as the embryo. Um, they really don't have any morphologic changes and that's to be expected over a 24 hour period. Here you can see that's the case. Um, we are able to track that, but we don't expect that much morphologically to happen. Importantly, and actually just hot off the presses, my, my team emailed me this morning, 
Um, we did RNA-seq on the yolk sacs and on the embryos and um, actually found some really interesting changes happening related to uh, in the patients, the exosomes from patients with frank diabetes. Um, we found significant uh, alterations in cholesterol efflux as well as uh, lipid metabolism. And those are critical pieces for um, critical pieces for early, early fetal development. So I'm really looking forward to getting back and seeing those data and seeing where they take us. So some final thoughts. BMI is wholly inadequate uh, for telling us about obesity-associated disease. Metabolic health is much more important, and the ability to measure that is really in its infancy. How does sick, people, how does sick fat make people sick? Well, it reversibly alters adipocyte-derived exosome microRNAs in a pathologic way, and that's um, stuff that we've shown and others have, have confirmed. Um, how does it drive cardiometabolic disease? We have data on insulin signaling. I didn't have time to show you data related to cholesterol efflux and macrophages. Um, we published that a few years ago. So there's, there's real functional uh, effect of these. And how do they act intergenerationally? Well, I showed you interaction with fetal development pathways. Um, but when you think about a, a fetus, you know, by the time a female uh, infant is born, they have their full complement of oocytes. And so this idea is, is really that those oocytes are exposed to, to mom, to grandma, basically, and that they can be, there can be lasting effects there. And essentially, a mom is affecting both her her daughter and her future grandchild uh, when there's a female infant involved. Um, and so that's really an interesting idea that I think uh, generates a lot of uh, discussion in our group. And I just want to thank the, the team from Children's National, as well as the folks in, in Chem and Pune, and Gina Tippick, of course, Suda has been involved with this for, for years as we've been doing this, and some of the other collaborators, and I'm happy to take questions, and I think I'm actually on time. A couple of quick questions. Um, of course. On, uh, what, what do you think these learnings can lead to in terms of interventions that one could possibly attempt? So I think you asked about interventions based on what we're seeing here. So there, there's a couple of things. Um, the first is being able to predict fetal outcomes uh, early in pregnancy and perhaps even preconceptually. Um, could, it, it provides the window, if not the tool, with which to modify outcomes. You know, there's always lifestyle changes for whatever that's worth. Um, but ultimately, there's, and, and our embryo studies are going to go this way, looking at things like methylation, et cetera, that where we do have things that can um, uh, that can alter those patterns and, and, and potentially be therapeutic. You know, the trick is always, you know, treating a pregnant woman, but I think there's some natural things, some food choices, et cetera, that can drive uh, changes in methylation, and that might be an avenue that is pursuable. Ah, yes, Back there. there. <laughs> so I had just a quick question. Yes. So these uh, microRNA, are they, uh, the effect is, are they activating the signaling or they're inhibiting the signaling? Yeah, so typically microRNAs and all short RNAs in eukaryotes are, uh, they, they suppress signaling, so I didn't, didn't have time to show it, or I thought I wouldn't have time, but essentially they bind to complementary sequences on mRNAs, and either if they bind in a promoter region, for example, then they will reduce the expression or do, reduce the translation of that RNA because they won't allow for that, uh, that binding to take place. If they, they also often will bind in areas that target that mRNA for degradation. So in general, what you see is, is an, sort of an opposite effect. So if the microRNA is up, the target mRNAs are typically down. So sometimes like the, it can also target the signaling receptor, I mean uh, inhibitors also, right? The, yes, the, yeah, absolutely. So it can, can be a double, a double negative, absolutely. Yeah. It gets very complicated. And, but one of the beautiful things about it is, is, is a, you know, we often see very small changes in microRNA expression, and those who do mRNA expression are typically not impressed. Oh, it's only, you know, 5% or something like that. But the effect is so profound that little changes mean a lot. Thank you so much. Yes. Great presentation. I'm going to talk about myokines. Um, so that's... Um, Can't wait. The, the perfect um, um, addition. Um, um, quick question. The... Um, adipose-derived exosomes, do you measure what's in them 
and the changes in, in, in a lean person versus uh, an obese person. Because exosomes, so the background is exosomes, as you know, have become sort of a buzzword. And we don't really know what's in them, how they affect other organs and so on. Yeah, it, it, it's tricky. So yeah, the, the field of exosomes is really relatively young and the technology is catching up. Um, I use the term exosomes because people are used to that but that's actually not even accurate. Um, extra small extracellular vesicles is actually the, the proper term, but that's kind of a mouthful. Um, in terms of measuring content, look, the, we know there's certain things in there. We know there's uh, adipocytokines, we know there's, uh, there's other proteins, there's certainly the microRNAs, and then the other thing that sort of, that, that's a big deal is, is what is the lipid content of the membrane? Right, so different lipids will have different effects, and we know that those are different uh, based on levels of adiposopathy, et cetera. So absolutely, the techniques just aren't quite there to measure in those tiny little vesicles. So the, there are a couple of biotech companies in the US and in South Korea selling exosomes um, from skincare to whatever. And um, it would be interesting to, actually, we, we don't know what's in them, but also, did you do, did you take them from an obese person, which would possibly have negative effects, right? Right. So our, the exosomes we use are all from primary. They're all from human tissues. We don't. We haven't used any purchased or cultured exosomes. I have a collaborator who uh, uses MS human MSC exosomes, which is very common, and and we've actually done some of the studies with those, um, looking at contents, et cetera, to try to explain the effect that they have. But you know. What you're describing is exactly what's happening is people throw these on something and they don't know what's in it and they see an effect. I mean, there's clearly an effect, but we don't know why. Uh, so my question is regarding, uh, what's your opinion about the gut flora when uh, mother is carrying a baby? I was hoping somebody would ask about microbiome. So, so we've actually done, so the gut flora, uh, we've done a little bit with the gut flora, but um, bacteria secrete their version of exosomes, all prokaryotes do, their version of exosomes. They're called OMVs, outer membrane vesicles for a gram-negative bacteria, and there's some other ones that come from gram-positives. Um, we've developed methods to actually, in the, the lung work we do, looking at um, exosomes or OMVs from uh, pulmonary microbiome, and, and we find them in circulation. We certainly find E. coli OMVs in circulation. So it is very likely the gut is providing a, um, a huge amount of circulating information, uh, signals to the body and regulating. And, uh, and you know, the, the trick there is that they don't make microRNAs, they make small RNAs that work similarly um, and can function at the risk and, the, and other similar sites. Um, but actually I have a graduate student who's gonna have a paper coming out this spring where she's basically created a pipeline, a bioinformatic pipeline to derive that and look at the energy signatures to create a database of short RNAs from specific bacteria and human targets. Well, if there are no further questions, then I have this pleasant duty of handing over this gift on behalf of the organizers. Thank you. nice and elaborate study of obesity in humans. Now we'll move on to another system. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. T.L. Srinath. Uh, the topic is rare genetic diseases, challenges accomplished, and unmet needs. So uh, Dr. Srinath is the CEO and director of uh, Genofi Biotech Private Limited. He obtained his PhD from CSIR, Indian Institute of Toxicology Research. Um, he has published several papers and also has worked as an instructor at the Indian Institute of Science. But then he uh, switched gears and uh, his inclination and dedication to result-oriented research led him to establish this company, uh, Genof uh, Biotech India Private Limited. His firm creates zebrafish analogs, the platforms for drug discovery, non-clinical evaluation, and genetic disease research. Dr. Sheena. Well, uh, apart from Genofi, I am director in another uh, startup, which is Alternatives Lab, and it is situated at IIT Guwahati. And uh, they make UTI kits. So when Sudha asked me to uh, you know, go into this session or the parallel one, I opted this one because I'm more uh, fascinated by rare diseases. 
and uh, so here I am. So uh, this is more towards you know uh, keeping you awake, and this is more as a target audience for me being the students. Uh, and uh, Sudha and Raja has introduced this particular topic on Ray. This is the session one. Uh, I would have loved to talk there, but I got this opportunity where clinicians might be around, uh, specifically after Rob. So starting with this particular pick of FIFA World Cup 2022, you can see one person who is called as goat or rather God. You can see him in the center. Yeah. So this person at the age of 11, uh, one doctor said that you are not growing to the level expected. Yeah. So at the time he was 5.4 and it was after one year of, one year of uh, assessment, it was found he has a deficiency of growth hormone being there. Now treatment was there. So it's a synthetic growth hormone which is available. Now the third factor is the cost. So it is $900 per month in that given time. This all three factors make a lot of difference in the rare disease. Just imagine if there was a no drug being there, probably he has the potential he wouldn't have even played. Or if money was not there in his pocket because his father wasn't earning that much. But then there was someone who found he has a caliber and then sponsored. So you have to understand that science proceeds, but then money part also comes into picture. And probably that's one of the reason I thought that something has to be done in the rare disease field so that we connect more dots, reduce the gaps in between. Now here is something called as miracle. Yesterday people were referring about, you know, marriage between academy and industry, but I will say marriage is not required. It's just an interaction. So you should have a miracle coming out of it. So it's rare disease with zebra fish and um, that is not from my lab, sorry. Uh, it will take a little more time. And so what I'm going to focus is 60 to 70% of my uh, presentation is regarding the challenges accomplished because we have to acknowledge what science has contributed and then how zebrafish as a tool, not an animal model, okay? I'm just putting it as a tool, how it can have an impact on the rare disease discoveries. Now the challenges I put into three big slots based on the uh, stakeholders. The first one is the criteria to define a disease as rare. Second is phenotype is hereditary or acquired. And the availability of therapies. Now what it seems, the first one funnily depends upon policies and the policies along with is the money part. Second is science and technology query, which, you know, out of curiosity, we contribute towards it. And then social need, well, I will come to that part subsequently. Now, if you see in this particular slide, you will actually see uh, the distribution based on the GDP into two equal halves. The money is distributed somewhat longitudinally, you can see. US, China, Japan, and Korea. So what about our subcontinent? So that means Whenever government comes with a budget, so after taking care of many other things, they have to think about health sector and then again a small section of it if they think about the rare diseases that comes into picture. How about private sector? Well, private sector is driven by profit until and unless they don't find any other scope to explore, probably they will think about rare diseases. Things have moved on, uh, things are progressing well. Uh, in last few uh, months, there are several calls which has come from the Indian government regarding addressing the needs of the rare disease and uh, our future is there now. So, and now to define what is rare disease, WHO actually says it's a debilitating, often long disease, lifelong disease or disorder with a prevalence of one or less per thousand population. However, different countries have their definitions to suit their specific requirements and in the context of their population, the healthcare system and resources. And to highlight upon that, let's see, this is the world population. China stands somewhere here and our country, India, stands here. And in India, it's less than one in 2,500. And now if we talk about other countries like Mexico, they have their own definition. Uh, US says 6.4 in 10,000 people in Europe. It's one in 2,000. 
And very recently, like in 2021, uh, China came up with its more broad kind of definition. It's with R. It's like an incidence which is one in 10,000 or prevalence of one in 10,000 or affected population 1,450,000. Uh, 1, this is a policy making and the money part comes from the funds through which the science and technology progresses further. Now, if I take two, three steps of history and bring to you the point addressing the rare disease along with it. So this is a hand-drawn image of Linus Pauling and his team. So you can clearly see RBC being there and this need not to tell, it is a sickle cell anemia. So we all know that Pauling was a fantastic uh, protein biologist or chemist, but he was struggling to find out how to correlate this particular phenotype. And then the tool which he used to address after doing NMR and other methods was electrophoresis. Uh, I request uh, people to have a look at this particular uh, journey of, he, uh, of the discovery of this molecular disease. Moving forward, in 1983, uh, this particular publication which addressed about the Huntington's disease, and you have to know that by the time there were known tools which were protein antigen markers or enzymatic markers, and they were not able to nail down how to have an assessment for Huntington's disease. And that time led to the adaptation of a new tool that was restriction fragment length polyformism. So if someone understands what is rare disease, sorry, uh, what is mutation, either it's a insertion of a sequence or a deletion of a sequence that can be found out through this method or else if it's a gain or loss of a restriction size. But it still didn't under, uh, address the uh, any point mutations which are there, which can lead to a loss of function or gain of function. Now, if you go by terms of phenotypes, so here it's a normal person, once in a while a bleeding will be there in nose. Probably everyone had it in our childhood. Can it be really called as a phenotype for a particular disease? Now, a normal person, normally looking person, if you assess their blood, probably they have not undergone a stress and an assessment is made, you can actually see some phenotype being there. And there are some phenotypes which are visible. Like in this case, it's for the facial phenotypes. And a new understanding is there that there are so many de novo mutations being there. So earlier, people used to think that only the uh, mother is the carrier or the father is the carrier passing over, but there are instances, if not 50%, at least 40% of instances are that they are de novo mutations. So that's a big contribution to the genomics era. Now, as in the previous session, it was mentioned, yes, the true uh, human sequence from end to end going through the centromere is now known, except for Y chromosome, I don't know why, but yeah, the future, it will be all completed off, and then, you know, uh, you can have both understanding from the uh, coding region and as well as the non-coding region. Now, this is like taking back to the uh, school chart, uh, one of the image which comes into your molecular biology. I like teaching this particular section. I think if you allow me, I can spend some three hours on this itself. I will keep it short and very precise. So I'm taking a situation where there's a mutation it's a dominant, and that two de novo. So that means somewhere here, it's present, either it's maternal or paternal gene, uh, chromosome, and then since it goes to the RNA, and this we are talking about a translation part being there, so mRNA, then a protein comes there, and its function gets affected. And remember now, I'm going to add more complexities here. Now what cells we are talking about, whether it's a germline cell or it's a somatic cell, and in that region, whether it's a gain of function or a loss of function. So let me add one more complexity here. Whether the mutation now is in a coding region or in a non-coding region. So the outcome is that it might have an effect on the protein concentration itself. So this is a big snapshot of anything what you do, want to do in terms of clinical research or try to understand what's happening inside a cell. And uh, it's fair enough to say is life is all about interactions and we know that any given change is leading to have a stronger interaction or a weaker interaction and cell 
uh, our cells go into that kind of mode, which you can see here. So what is the outcome? I will just keep it into two, whether it affects signaling or it affects the metabolite. Straight away, keeping very simple, either of these two, where is the, if there is an imbalance, leads to an outcome. Now, going more deeper, where is it? It actually matters. It's inside a single cell. And this cell comp makes a composition in the body systems. And then let's say if you're talking about therapeutic. Now this therapeutic has a lot of challenge now. It doesn't have a GPS tracker or a Google map being there or someone is not giving instruction from back and it's just charge based or the interaction based, it leads to a particular region. So the challenges are that there are 30, 300, uh, sorry, 30 to 40 trillion cells. The target, when it is going, it has to say whether this is the one that I have to act upon or it's a similar kind of protein because many of them carry the same domains. And then it has its own half-life. You eat it and it gets digested, doesn't make any sense because it has to reach to the particular region. And the region might, if you're targeting uh, something which goes to the nucleus, just understand it has to cross two to three barriers being there. And then it's a, the treatment is one time or several times. Is it a diabetic once or is something like uh, you are coming with a gene therapy being there, which is like one shot and it has to you know, do its work. And we, most of the time we forget this fact that the similar number of cells are there along with us, which is microbiota. So if you have an oral based kind of thing, it's a nutritional one, certainly it has a big role to play. So I have said so many complex things here to deal with. There are certain challenges which have been accomplished and we should be uh, uh, acknowledging the kind of contribution which has gone uh, in the past decades, especially after the CRISPR came into the picture. So these are the gene therapies and the diseases for which it's present. Some of them are in clinical phase three and some of them have already got data. They are just waiting for to have it into the uh, need of the people. But this is how it is. The science has worked to that level but that they are able to get a fruit out of it after laborious. There are no leaves on this particular tree but then still it's not accessible. And that's what I was talking about, the health equity. Now what about the remaining rare diseases? The actual count of rare diseases is like 10,867. Probably I had shown some seven to eight which are you know, accessible right now if some, in terms of being therapy, having some therapeutics being there. Now, if you talk to a person or the family who has a child with it, they actually will say, I don't care, my child is one in 2,500, one in million. The child is child. What's the solution for it? So, there are certain treatments available, as you can see in this list. Oops. So close to 500 treatments are available. So the treatment means either it is a drug being there or it's a surgery available for them or it's a nutritional one. So this has to expand. And that's where I think young generation like you has to focus right now because if you think about it now, probably another five years to 10 years, something can be done at this level. Now, yeah, so, uh, Please take out your phone and who is interested in rare disease, click on it because February 28th is considered as a rare disease day um, because 28th is uh, like in 11, uh, 12 months, one of the months which has shorter number of days. So this event is conducted by uh, a, fam a person whose son was affected with a rare disease. Uh, his name is Harsha and he, uh, he has this forum called as Indo-US Rare and he has conveyed hi to Rob. And, uh, since uh, there will be many Science Day events, because 20th February is also Science Day for us, but fortunately you can see the timing is 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. of IST. So whatever you do in the daytime, evening time, please just attend this meet. Now, the unmet need is having a animal model being there. So if you clearly see there are so many diseases, okay, which are unknown. The basket is filling up as and when people are coming with new variants being there. It's like a finding a needle in a haystack is turning into like needle in an ocean now. So you have to get rid of many of the unwanted data and then you have some amount, some diseases which are actually diagnosable or poorly defined. 
how we are going to work on something. So sometimes you have to have a, a model for it. Now when the model part comes, you actually focus on this three sections, that is basic research or early discovery or preclinical. This is where my company comes into picture. And once something is there, then it goes into the human trial. And we have to understand very clearly the amount of effort goes in this, utilization of money, time, that finally adds up into the clinical trial value also. So sometimes if someone claims that, you know, this is the uh, cost of the uh, product in the market, many times it's because of the uh, money which has got into the research part. So here is the test cost, uh, cost matrix. You can, uh, it's not to the scale, but just to say that zebrafish as a vertebrate model fits very well in the system. And zebrafish is not going to replace the rodents requirement. Even if FDA says that we have to reduce down the usage of animals or not required, still, somewhere you have to start with. And fish is a good model. And uh, it has 70% of genes, protein coding genes, which is uh, there, and 84% of uh, disease-related ones are also conserved in there. So if you look at comparison, or how much of human uh, genome is a fish one is 70, and with the rodents, if you see, it is 83. So we are good amount of fish being there, even if you are vegetarian by nature. And then predictively wise toxicity, there is a good amount of uh, correlation being there. And let me have the last three minutes telling you a happy story. How a zebra fish made a change in one person's life. So this is a 2019 paper where a person who had a lymphatic anomaly was not responding to the regular drugs given to them. So what the doctors did, they got in touch with the uh, scientists and they said, Let's, uh, after getting it sequenced, they found that there is a mutation and that is present even, I mean, the wild type, the sequence is present even in zebrafish. So they went ahead with creating a transgenic for it and then they saw, because it's a gain of mutation, so you can clearly see they, amount of vessels are there, they are dilated a lot. And uh, with this, they were able to screen some drugs and they came across one of the, they found some of the MEK inhibitors are able to do their job by reducing the expression being there. So then, this is one chart which clinicians will like to see, for part particularly for rare disease, where you can clearly see that uh, at the start of the 13th year, the boy was given this treatment after the required approval. And this is a dramatic change. In six months, this is the change what has gone into the boy. Now he's normal. And if you can see the x-ray here, and you can clearly appreciate the amount of the uh, lymphatic drains which were there in abdomen has gone down. And this is the list of uh, uh, some of the selected therapies uh, which have come through zebra fish. Uh, and uh, I have updated it. They, the ones which are in uh, the uh, parathesis, some of them are like they were paused during the COVID time and probably they are back into trials now. So my company, we are trying to address this kind of requirements using uh, non-regular animal models. And we have three different verticals, drug discovery and development, personalized medicine, as well as rare diseases. And we also want to contribute more in the happy stories. And we are funded by CCAMP. Uh, we have got grants from the Karnataka Elevate, as well as now we are procuring some funds from BBC also through BIRAC. And uh, thank you, Sudha and Raja. And let's see how many changes we can do in lives. Thank you. Thank you, Srinath, for this wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. Srinath, uh, one quick practical question um, yeah. is, um, how expensive is it at an individual patient level to do these kind of validations? And what do you think is the time frame? The time frame is close to one, one and a half years if we want our F2 generation being there, or if we just want to work with F1 generation, I will say eight months from the start, that is one. Cost-wise, um, even if we try to uh, you know, keep at no profit, Using the CRISPR methods and others, close to 3 to 3.5 lakhs is required. Because creating model itself is not sufficient. Subsequently, we have to look for what are the biomarkers that we have to look for. And after having a biomarker being there, then we have to do a screening for them. So 
The screening part can be like on a shared basis or it can be look for some other funding sources, but at least to create a model and then to have some markers to chase will take at least 3.5 to 5 lakhs. Thank you. Welcome. If you take the universe of rare diseases, all the rare diseases, what percentage of the population will have one or the other rare disease? Because there's so many of them. As I mentioned that, you know, every year 300 new registrations are being done. As, but this number, what I showed, it's uh, uh, from the RareX organization. They come up with this ex a fantastic report in 2022. And in the last one year, the number hasn't changed, like 10,867. So mostly the phenotypes, what are there, the clinicians actually put them into one basket. Right. So altogether, if I have to answer, then it's Three, About a million or more cases exactly. in India. Exactly. It's yeah. very close to the number of diabetic patients. It's not really rare if you combine all of them. Yes. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was trying to okay, say. Okay, it's, it's, it's I not very it rare if you combine It's not very rare, but it's a collective one. It's a collective yeah. one. So there's some ultra-rare diseases like being there only in one child or uh, four people. Small gift for you. Okay, let's move on to the final talk of the day, uh, for the session. Um, this will be given by Dr. Harsh Seth. Uh, Dr. Seth uh, carried out his postdoctoral research at the Institute of Genetic Medicine. Um, as a part of uh, Professor Sir John Byrne and Professor Oris Weltman's research group. He's currently working as an assistant professor and head of advanced genomics, uh, genomic technologies division at Fridges Institute of Human Genetics in Ahmedabad. His work involves cancer genetics, genomics, cancer chemo prevention, molecular diagnostics, genetics, cytogenetics, and molecular cytogenetics. Dr. Hart said. The topic of his talk, uh, title of his talk is Genomics in India, a Vanguard of Molecular uh, Modern Healthcare, a Tale of Two Diseases. Thank you, Professor, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me here and giving the opportunity to, to present some of the work that my group has been doing for the past four years. Now, I'm going to stick my neck out and I'm going to say that uh, genetics is one particular arena in, in healthcare whereby even if there is a mutation, you can try and prevent the disease from coming in the first place. Uh, and even if a disease is running in the family, you can still prevent the disease from going on to the next generation, and we need to take benefit of that. But the biggest challenge actually comes when it comes to diagnosis, because this is where you would see a lot of bottlenecks coming through, especially in terms of cost. And this is where my group really kicks in. And uh, throughout the journey from 2015 till now, I've, be, I've been involved in a whole host of things, such as understanding the pharmacogenetics of warfarin in Indian population, developing rapid molecular diagnostics with a company called Quantum DX, which is now more than a startup. It has got more than 100 people in the UK. Um, understanding the role of uh, de novo mutations and identifying genes in male infertility, uh, studying colorectal cancer, and hereditary cancers, lysosomal storage disorders, autism spectrum disorders, and much, much more. But today, out of all of these collections, I'm going to talk about two diseases. One is hereditary colorectal cancer, or Lynch syndrome, and the second one being lysosomal storage disorder. And the whole premise of my talk lies in these, uh, in these two lines, which, which were said by Thomas Adams in 1618. He is a better physician that keeps diseases off us than he that cures them being on us. Prevention is so much better than healing because it saves the labor of being sick. And this is exactly what genetics should be about. And so now that uh, we have had our lunch and the food has been passing through our GI tract and it's just about to reach our gut, it's a good time to start talking about gut in the first place. Now on the left hand side, uh, you would see that that's how your healthy colon would look like, nice smooth lines. But as you go along, you start having little bulbs, which are, call which are called as adenoma, and later on they develop into big mushroom type structures known as carcinoma, and if they, are, uh, they remain unchecked, then they metastasize. Now, generally, when you see these patients coming through the clinic, then five out of every six patients would go along the upper pathway, which is known as familial adenomatous polyposis. Essentially here, your chromosomes get jumbled up quite a bit, uh, and, you, and you have to give treatment accordingly. But about one in six patients that would walk through the clinic, they would take the bottom route. 
where you have mismatch repair deficiency. This is where you have little spell uh, spelling errors in your DNA occurring all over the place. And if they remain unchecked, they can become cancerous. And in these patients is where you find Lynch syndrome. Now, Lynch syndrome is not something new. Previously, it was known as hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. Quite a mouthful of a word, but now it is known as Lynch syndrome after the guy Henry Lynch who really made it popular. And it's an autosomal dominant disorder, which is primarily caused due to mutations in one of the six, uh, one of the five mismatch repair genes, MSH2, MSH6, MLH1, PMS2, and now there is EPCAM as well. And these patients have lifetime uh, risk of colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, upper GI, and genitourinal cancers. In some cases, their lifetime risk can be as high as 80%. Now, WHO actually estimates that the, uh, that the incidence in the, prop uh, in the population is about 1 in 125. But that seems slightly high because it takes into account these low penetrant PMS2 and EPCAM gene car carriers. But uh, even, if you take, even if you remove them, the incidence still remains 1 in 300. That's twice as high as uh, Down syndrome. So clearly, it's very, very common. And like I said, these patients have a significant lifetime risk of having cancer, especially if you're an MLH1 gene carrier, the lifetime risk can be as high as 80%. And these are the patients you really want to pick up early on because in these patients, you can start to think about cancer prevention. Now, generally, these patients, they come into the clinic once they have had cancer, and the usual pathway is you would do MSI testing by PCR or immunohistochemistry. Um, if they are microsatellite stable, it's most likely a sporadic tumor. But if it's MSI high, you would do BRAF, V6, and B testing. If you have the mutation, then again, they're more likely to be sporadic. But if you don't have the mutation, you are more likely to be Lynch syndrome carrier, and then you go for germline testing. So quite a complicated pathway to go through. And as I, and we, we hear a lot about the word MSI or microsatellites. And this is exactly what they look like. There are a bunch of letters that keep on repeating themselves multiple times. The, if one letter is repeating again and again, it's called mononucleotide. If two letters are repeating, they're called dinucleotides. Now imagine, if you were to count these letters, a lot of you would make an error. Similarly, our body also makes, uh, our, our polymerase also makes errors sometimes in counting how many Ds or CNAs there are. And the way it corrects them is using mismatch repair system. It's a collection of proteins that come together, and they're kind of like spell checkers uh, or autocorrect mechanism you have on your phone. If you make a spelling mistake, they'll tell you, ah, you've made an error, please correct it. It's exactly the same system out here, okay? And if this mechanism breaks down, then you start having incorporation of an extra T or reduction of, uh, of the letter T, and this is known as microsatellite instability testing. And this breakdown occurs in Lynch syndrome patients. And in these patients, immunotherapy works very well. I'll just give you an example in a moment. Now currently, there are two methods uh, that are used clinically for detecting these patients. Uh, one is immunohistochemistry, the, one, the other one is PCR-based fragment length analysis. Now immunohistochemistry requires uh, highly trained professionals looking down the microscope, looking at the slides, looking at the tumors, and saying, okay, there is expression or non-expression of a given protein. So they're equivalent to somebody, uh, uh, your archers. They are extremely good, but the problem is they can't scale up. You can't have too many people. It, it's too costly. The other one is fragment length analysis. Now, this is a PCR-based approach. That's great. The problem is you still have to see results manually, and sometimes you can have interoperator discordance. And because of that, uh, this molecular diagnostic technique is somebody having a gun and pointing and shooting. But what we really, really want is a scenario whereby you have a machine gun. You simply click the trigger and you go. And one of the ways you can do that is by scaling up uh, using sequencing-based approaches, which, uh, through which you can not only reduce the cost, you can improve the throughput and make it automatable. And that's exactly what uh, my group has been trying to do. And to do this, we went back to a technique that was invented way back in 1994. At that time, it was called padlock probes. Nowadays, it's known as uh, single molecule molecular inversion probes, or SMIPs, for short. The idea is pretty simple. These probes, they, they attach on either side of the region of interest. And each of these probes have a little tag or a, mo or a molecular barcode. So every time it attaches to a DNA, it gives it a code. So you can actually measure how many unique molecules did you actually capture during this event. Now, the upfront cost of developing these probes are pretty high. 
But once you have once you have manufactured this probe, you can use it for more on more than 10 lakh samples. So actually, your per sample cost is ridiculously low, around uh, 10 pesa to be more precise. Now, apart from that, there was uh, one more thing we wanted to do. Generally, all of the MSI assays that are currently used, they use very long mononucleotide repeats. Now, these are not sequenceable. So we went, uh, so we started hunting for short mononucleotide repeats, which were sequenceable, somewhere around seven to 12 base pair long, and they were within the Illumina's error rate, uh, machine error rates. And they were right next to an informative SNP. And here's, the re here's an example of that. These are three markers out here. Uh, the, the top row is matched normal, the bottom row is the tumor. And you can see that there are one letter or two letter deletions that are occurring in uh, MSI high tumors compared to matched normal. And at the same time, there was one more technique, uh, there was one more reason why we added SNPs. Uh, when you do PCR, sometimes, like I said, polymerase can make an error, but it should make error equally on both alleles. But if you have microsatellite instability, a genuine one, it will only occur on one allele, and this is known as allelic bias. And that's exactly what we started seeing, that in patients who have got microsatellite, a genuine microsatellite instability, you would see this instability occurring on one allele, preferentially over the other. So now we had a way to even reduce the noise in our data set. And using that, we identified 24 markers, um, and we had built-in redundancy. So even if out of 24, six markers worked, that's great. Um, and we had initially a cohort of uh, 100, uh, 100 patients. This was the discovery cohort, and we got 100% sensitivity and specificity. So we said, okay, great. How about we take another 100 patient cohort and run, and run this assay in them to see how sensitive or specific it is, or a validation cohort, uh, in short. And it, Indeed, we found 100% sensitivity and specificity in it. Here is, uh, here is the result out here. Not only this, because there are SNPs involved, you can trace the sample if by chance there is a sample mix-up occurring. This technique uh, is now covered by two patents, worldwide patents, I'm, uh, I'm the name inventor in one of them, and this entire technique got published in Human Mutation back in 2019. Now, its applicability really came in handy when we are, when we are talking about better uh, uh, when we are talking about prognosis, because patients who have got MSI high cancers overall have a better prognosis. Not only that, they are more likely to benefit from immunotherapies rather than 5-fluorouracil. Uh, and in these patients, you can start to think about uh, whether they are Lynch syndrome or not. And that is where my next uh, my second part of the talk begins. Back in 1990s, when I was a young chap, uh, my future supervisor uh, started a trial known as CAP2. Essentially, it's a two by two factorial trial whereby you had 1,000 Lynch syndrome patients. Half of them were given aspirin, half of them were given a, a placebo. And they were given this intervention for two years and then they were followed up for 20 years. And in 2020, finally, after a 25 year stint uh, where I was involved uh, in joint data analysis, we finally published a paper in Lancet whereby we showed that patients who were given 600 milligrams a day aspirin for more than two years had reduced risk of colorectal cancer by up to 50%. Not only that, when we did number to treat analysis, it turns out that if we had given aspirin to just 24 patients, we would have saved cancer in one of these patients. So that's substantial. That's nearly uh, tenfold higher than when you think about colonoscopies. In terms of its impact on public, uh, in 2020, UK's National Institute of Health and Care Excellence put out a guideline saying that patients who are Lynch syndrome carriers can take aspirin, but baby aspirin, that's about 600 to 150 milligrams aspirin a day to reduce the risk of cancer. Not only that, since I said it's a two by two factorial, uh, factorial trial, another set of 500 patients were given resistant starch. So that's the sort of starch you would find in slightly unripe bananas. Um, and again, the, uh, they were given intervention for two years, and the remaining half were given placebo. And after following them up for 20 years, we identified that patients who were taking resistant starch had reduced risk of upper GI cancers. Now, these are primarily your liver, um, stomach, and gallbladder cancers. And they are, they are very, very difficult to diagnose, and even if you diagnose, the, the prognosis is not very good. So this was, in fact, an excellent news. But the cherry on top was we managed to get bananas on the cover of the journal. As, as an impact of it in India, 
they, they are twofold. Number one, uh, finally, these guidelines are being put out by the ICMR. Uh, so you would see the impact of this work coming through uh, in this year itself. And not only that, for the first time, my group is involved in, um, in participating in the uh, prospective Lynch syndrome database. So essentially, these patients are, are annually followed up and we collect their information prospectively so that we can better measure the outcomes the, of, of an intervention or how well they are doing after the cancer diagnosis. And this database, by the way, is open to all. Anybody can use it. So now, moving on to the final part of my talk. And this, for this one, I'm going to talk about a rare disease known as lysosomal storage disorder. These are a group of 70 disorders uh, in total and with a combined uh, incidence of one in 5,000. But if you look at them individually, they're quite rare. And mostly they follow autosomal recessive mode of inheritance or X-linked inheritance. Um, but in India, what you would find is that about 20 out of these 70 disorders are very, very common. So that's exactly what we want to focus on. Now, generally, your traditional diagnostic pathway uh, looks at clinical recording. You would then think of some sort of biochemical screening, and if that comes out to be positive, then you would do enzymatic confirmation, and if that comes out to be positive, then you would do genetic testing. But the problem with this disorder is that the phenotypes, uh, phenotypes can be quite overlapping. So sometimes you kind of get in, uh, encapsulated in this circle. You keep on having this iterative diagnostic pathway. And because of that, the diagnostic odyssey for some of these patients can go as long as five years. The cost can start to rack up. And because of that, the diagnostic yield is just as low as 5%. That's absolutely abhorrent. Considering that in India, it is estimated that there are 240,000 such children with these disorders, but only 12,000 are known to medical services. So there is clearly a need for a low cost and easy to use tool. And obviously one would think, why don't you just do whole exome sequencing or just have a large panel? The problem is, just because you have a large panel doesn't mean you get a substantially high uh, diagnostic yield. The diagnostic yield, even with 800 gene panel, still is stuck at 60%. That's not good enough, we need something better. So for this part, we again focused you, uh, on using SMIP technology because if it's good at detecting somatic mutations, surely it would be excellent at detecting germline variants. But we wanted to use it in such a way that it would fit on Illumina MySeq, which is the most uh, abundantly available sequencing platform throughout India. And uh, we focused on 23 common lysosomal storage disorder. And this technique was developed jointly with uh, Dr. Jayashet uh, and my PhD student Adira Nair, together with Dr. Madhvi and uh, Professor C.G. Joshi at Gujarat Biotechnology Research Center. And we, we, uh, we started following the ACMG guidelines of how you should design the panel, how you should validate it, how you should optimize it. And at the same time, we ensure that it should fit on Illumina MySeq flow cell. Whether it's the smallest or the largest, it should just fit on it. And at the same time, it should be able to detect not just single nucleotide variants, but copy number variants as well, because they tend to get missed quite a bit. And it follows a simple, uh, well, garden variety pathway. You would do library prep, you would pool all the samples together, you would do sequencing, do computational analysis, and do reporting. But the idea was to try and squish it as closely as possible so that you can also reduce cost and time to diagnosis. To begin with, we, we started with 50 patients, uh, sorry, 49 patients for whom we had a molecular genetic diagnosis and we simply wanted to validate whether our assay is able to reproduce that or not. And it did. In one case where it didn't, the reason was that the assay didn't cover that particular segment of the gene because of low complexity uh, structure. But nonetheless, it did something wonderful. It was able to identify not only multi-exonic CNV, so you can see out here it's a heterozygous uh, deletion in this gene, multi-exonic deletion, but it was able, also able to uh, detect single exon CNV, which are extremely difficult to diagnose. So once we were convinced that yes, it, it's as good as it says on the tin, we then prospectively uh, tested it out in 175 patients, whereby we were either clinically suspecting that, oh, whereby we were suspecting that they have LSD, or we had a biochemical result that said that they are having a lysosomal storage disorder. 
And in this cohort, our diagnostic yield was a whopping 80%. The area where the diagnostic yield started to falter was in Gaucher's disease and Hunter disease, because these two genes have a pseudogene in the genome, and therefore it's very, very difficult to resolve the reads, but now we have in fact created a brand new bioinformatics pipeline that is able to get around this problem. Uh, and now there is an Indian pattern that covers this as well. Not only this, remember I had said that it has to be low cost? The cost of DNA extraction, library prep, sequencing, and data analysis, all of this combined for the patient is 10,000 rupees. If you say, no, I want an enzymatic confirmation because you have a variant of uncertain significance, fine. It'll cost 12,000 rupees flat. Now, because it's on MySeq, you can have as little as four samples or as high as 50 samples. So you have great flexibility. And at the same time, when it comes to data analysis, you can finish from FASTQ file to an annotated VCF file in under 45 minutes, and the overall turnaround time is less than 30 days. But does that mean I should use this technique in daily practice? Should I just remove biochemical assay altogether? I don't think so. No, we shouldn't. In cases where there is a surefire uh, clinical suspicion that this, that this patient is going to have, say, Gaucher's disease, you can very well do biochemical uh, screening and enzymatic confirmation, and it would be cheaper for the patient but in cases whereby you're not sure in which bin is this patient really fitting in, then you can think about this hypothesis-free approach whereby you do genetic testing first, you identify the variant, and then go for a biochemical confirmation. And uh, as, now, as a follow-on for this, we, uh, we have now uh, received funding from the DBT to create India's first biobank for lysosomal storage disorder. So this is where the patient doesn't just receive diagnosis, but we take their, their DNA, their RNA, and even uh, cells and store them so that anybody who wants to work on therapeutics or any other new technique, they can absolutely use it. This biobank will be available from 2024. Not only that, we partnered up very recently with Sanofi Genzyme, so that's, uh, that's one of the makers of enzyme replacement therapy, and we are now offering these molecular uh, diagnostic tests free of cost to the patient. The only thing you have to do is fill out, is fill out a, con a consent form and send the blood sample to us and we'll do biochemical as well as genetic testing free of cost for at least these five uh, lysosomal storage disorder. And this is, by the way, available in clinical practice right now. So, in summary, MSI together with BRAF mutation testing in colorectal cancer biopsy can detect Lynch syndrome patients. If you do identify them, you can either give them uh, aspirin or you can go bananas, whichever route you would like to go. Uh, in terms of guidelines, uh, both in the US as well as in the UK, the guidelines now recommend uh, people taking aspirin if they are diagnosed to, uh, to be Lynch syndrome carriers in order to reduce their risk of cancer. In terms of optimal dose, uh, remember the trial did it at 600 milligrams a day. Uh, the guidelines recommend 100 milligrams a day. But right now there is indeed a trial going on called CAP3. Uh, whose data will be released in about 2025. So we should see which dose would really be helpful in these patients. In terms of optimal duration, we can uh, say with some degree of surety that at least two years' use of aspirin would be better, but there are some telltale signs that longer the use of, uh, of aspirin, the better the outcome tends to be. In terms of, um, yeah, in terms of lysosomal storage disorder, both uh, biochemical assay as well as genetic techniques are helpful, but you need to be careful of when to use which technique. Uh, our assay is able to cover 23 lysosomal storage disorders in India for the cost of 10,000 rupees, and the diagnostic yield is uh, up to 80% in this cohort. And um, it's high throughput, it's accurate, it's able to detect not just SNV, but CNVs as well. And at the same time, because it is fitting on uh, MySeq, you have flexibility of how many samples you can put on it. Now, this assay is available uh, for use throughout India. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank all the wonderful advisors, team members, not just national, but also international collaborators, our funders, GSBTM, uh, DBT, MRC, Cancer Research UK, and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for this wonderful talk. Any questions? Do you think some of these diseases, depending on what kind of genetic variants you're likely to see, um, will benefit from very focused panels rather than just a whole exome approach? 
um, just as you've defined the problem. Yes, ma'am. So, sorry. So, ma'am, generally, I come from the school of thought that what question you are asking, you should only answer that question, not try to answer everything else. So, when it comes to microsatellite instability testing, right? Generally, you would use immunohistochemistry or fragment length analysis, or nowadays you've even got TMB testing. But they become very expensive because you still end up doing PRAF testing in order to identify Lynch syndrome and so on and so forth. That's a very iterative pathway. So imagine if you have a panel which is able to do MSI, BRAF, KRAS, NRAS, HRAS. These are the key themes you really want to analyze in colorectal cancer patients. That would make your life so much simpler. By the way, I didn't tell you the cost of this MSI assay. The, uh, the cost of MSI assay for a patient is 8,000 rupees. The NGS assay, by the way. If you do uh, fragment length analysis or immunohistochemistry, that costs about six to 8,000. PRAF testing, another 6,000 on top. So we are anyways cheaper than that. So sometimes focusing a panel really helps. Have you considered um, using long read platforms uh, just for s specific single genes, for example, as amplicons? I would think about it on just two conditions. Either they reduce their cost of sequencing or they improve their accuracy of base calling. Uh, in my early 20s to late 35, I had a good amount of migraine. I used to eat bananas as well as aspirin. How safe I am? Pretty good, I would say. But, but there is a caveat. In fact, uh, there was an addendum to the CAP2 study. Generally, patients who are obese have even higher risk of developing cancer down the line, right? And what aspirin was doing in these obese patients was simply reducing that excess risk uh, that they were getting from obesity. Mm -hmm. But as any good doctor would say, that's great if you're taking aspirin and banana, but make sure you have reduced intake of red meat or, uh, or oil or sugary food and make sure that you are lean, not obese. I'm ready to be a sample for you. I'd be very happy to. <laughs> okay. So I was just wondering if uh, you said it's all ready to go to the clinic and seems to be properly optimized. Are there any takers for this? Uh, is it being implemented in any of the clinics? So as far as the MSI testing goes, because it was partly funded by the Cancer Research UK, mm -hmm. uh, it has now been taken up by their accelerator program. In fact, it is now being utilized in the Newcastle University Hospital Trust. That's northeast part of England, where it, is now, where it has now replaced a traditional MSI testing platform. Um, as far as India goes, MSI testing is slightly challenging by NGS because of the quality of the DNA yeah. you get. Uh, for the lysosomal storage disorder panel, we have in fact started doing uh, genetic testing from our clinic, and we have also partnered uh, with a company who is working towards turning it into a nice shiny kit and putting it in everybody's hands, so it's not just up to us, it's, uh, it goes to everybody. So I'm sure all of you agree that this has been quite an enlightening session on use of genomics in uh, clinical research. I guess uh, it's become more and more apparent that genomics is really going to be very important for this decade for precision medicine as well as various types of problems that are plaguing in terms of uh, various rare diseases as well as uh, uh, all kinds of other disorders including some of the common ones. So thank you once again for all the speakers for this really wonderful expositions and thank you the organizers for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you professor galande for chairing this session it's been wonderful so uh with the end of the session we take a short break for tea and then we uh, reassemble here at 4 p.m there's also a special announcement so i think many of you have been complaining that the sessions are tightly packed and you've not got enough time to interact so we are delighted to be the hosts for a high tea today, this evening. So please stay back, enjoy your high tea, and you'll have ample opportunity to interact with all the speakers. Thank you all. It will be served at 7 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>